with Deborah and Michelle. Okay. Patrick, can you see the people that are in the room? Yeah. Okay, great. Hey, Deborah. Hi, Michelle. One is on mute. Yeah. Hey there. How you doing? Hey, good. How are you doing? Can't complain. <laughs> yeah, it's good. To, it's good to see you again. Good to see you too. Yeah. <laughs> Looking forward right. for your expertise. <laughs> well, good. Good. Uh, I better do it then. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's only a few of us here, obviously. Um, and that's fine. Um, I think what this lends itself to is to having more of a discussion. So, um, you know, I'm going to talk through a lot of these slides. I'm going to go through some of this because I know they're also recording this for other people to watch later. Um, so we'll kind of do a sort of um, uh, 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 like combined discussion slash presentation. So I'm not, I don't want to talk just at, at, just at you, but if you want to interject, if you have comments, if you have questions, um, please, please feel free to interrupt and we can uh, talk about anything you like as we go through this, through this slide deck. Um, how's that sound? Good. Okay. If you're not complaining, then I'm going to keep going. So um welcome everyone to effective messaging uh, my name is patrick sweeney um, i am a librarian originally from california i now live in the beautiful state of maryland um, uh, i was the um, library manager in lincoln library in uh, lincoln california branch managers in in san mateo county and then uh, deputy director of sunnyvale public library but I was also a school librarian in Santa Cruz Public Library. So, uh, you know, I've been in California for a long time, even though I'm not there anymore. Um, but I really appreciate you all having me um, for this session. If you have any questions or if you want to follow up with anything afterwards, you can always find me online as PC Sweeney. Um, I'm just PC Sweeney on the internet because there's a million Patrick Sweeney's on the internet. So um, uh, if you want to find me, if you Google PC Sweeney, it's me or a police dog in the UK. Um, so I'm very easy to find online um, for any follow up questions that you might have. So we're going to get started here. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, is I'm going to get into some of the data and then we're going to go through some of the methodology for building more effective messaging. And then I am going to use the current state of book banning um, as our case study. And I'm going to walk through what um, some message development might look like in practice or as we're doing it at every library around the book banning using big data sets and that kind of thing. Um, but first, I always like to start these sessions with a lot of the data about understanding support for libraries. Because remember, we are building messaging in order to uh, build support for libraries, political power and influence for libraries. And in order to do that, I really think that we need to be learning uh, from politics uh, as our primary source of information about how to do this work. Um, the political industry is, I mean, incredibly huge. Um, the amount of data uh, that they're building, the amount of data about voters, the amount of data about messaging, uh, you know, the amount of testing that they're doing on new methods for engaging the public in order to build support. I mean, I mean it's billions of dollars a year and funding around just understanding messaging and politics. Um, if we look at like political campaigns like Donald Trump's or Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign, uh, you know, we see that each of them spent somewhere around $400 million individually on just digital media, you know? So like uh, there's no better testing ground than the political world. So that's why a lot of what I'm gonna talk about from this session comes from the political industry. Um, it comes from both sides of the aisle, quite honestly. Um, every library goes to a political conference on both the left and the right side of politics. And that, of course, learns us, uh, allows us to learn from everybody, but it also allows us to meet, co make connections with uh, political operatives, consultants, and organizations that can help us fight for libraries uh, when we're speaking to, both, to voters on both the left and the right side of politics. 
Um, we're also learning from politics because 98% of library funding is political in nature. Uh, about 90% of library funding is from the will of the local voters and the local politicians, um, city council, county commissioners, library boards. Um, the, the other three to five percent comes from the state on average across the country and another three to five percent from the federal government. It leaves only one to two percent of funding for libraries uh, is philanthropic on average across the country. And what that means is if we want to engage the public in a meaningful way, uh, then we need to be engaging them politically because that is where our funding is. Um, we're gonna jump into some of the attitudes about libraries. So, you know, I think this data is really important. I'm gonna dive really deeply into some newer data that we have around book bans, um, but I'm gonna start with some of the more general data that we have uh, that I think is a little bit outdated now and I'm getting very nervous about, but I do want to talk through why I think it still holds. So we think, see things like the civic attitudes about libraries is from a Pew report from 2016. So this is now six years, six years old. Um, I'd love to see this data set run again, um, but I still think a lot of this still holds true. Uh, millennials use libraries at a higher rate than any other demographic. Parents are more likely to use libraries than adults without children. And the majority of Americans hold very positive views about libraries. So, you know, I've never won a library campaign um, uh, and had the public say that they hate libraries. They may disagree with some of the books on the shelves. They may disagree with taxes or government, um, but they typically like libraries or have some kind of positive view about libraries. They just believe somebody else should pay for them or there should be different books on the shelves. I am very concerned though, and remember this is six-year-old data that with the, a lot of the newer attacks on libraries, that we are going to start seeing people say that they hate libraries because uh, the right is messaging them that libraries are bastion of uh, uh, liberal propaganda and Marxism and grooming children and all that kind of stuff. So um, I imagine that we are going to get attacked uh, in such a way that, uh, really reduces the amount of people who hold positive views about libraries. And that's something I think we need to be really, really aware of um, in a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, if we look at voter attitudes, so this, this data comes from the Awareness to Funding study from OCLC and the Gates Foundation. If you haven't read these studies, there's one in 2008, one in 2018. Um, I think they're one of the, they're, they're some of the most important pieces of research that has been done in librarianship. I think the data is incredibly, incredibly interesting, not necessarily useful, um, but incredibly interesting and in understand the baseline of support for libraries across the country. I, I'll talk about more why I don't think it's useful. I think it's interesting as we go through this session. Um, but overall in 2018, again, this data is four years old now, um, you know, we see libraries above 50% um, uh, at positive for these, these beliefs about libraries, an essential local institution, advancing education, community pride, enhancing quality of life. I think those are all great. Those are something to remember as we're building our messages. Um, talking about the library as an institution, talking about the library as an organization that advances education. Uh, you know, libraries that win awards tend to uh, have more support at the ballot box um, because people are proud of that library, right? Um, and then libraries also enhance the quality of life, messages around that and targeting around that about how libraries um, uh, are part of a holistic solution to lowering crime rates, uh, reducing recidivism, um, uh, improving economic wealth, all those kinds of things I think work very, very well. And I think this is why it's because voters already have a lot of these views and we're, we're uh, relying on those views in order to move that forward. And I'll talk more about that later in the session. But what I think we really need to be aware of, and I don't think enough people are aware of, and if if like we talk publicly about something from this session, I think it really needs to be the voter attitudes um, uh, about libraries. So in 2008, when they first ran the awareness to funding study, they found that 37% of Americans would definitely vote yes for the library. 37% are likely to vote yes for the library and 26% are likely or definitely going to vote no. Now, what's interesting in messaging, if I had all the money in the world 
Um, I would talk to all three of these groups all the time about all the different ways that libraries are wonderful, but I don't. I have a finite amount of resources. And so I need to think about how I, how I use uh, my finite resources in order to get the most gain, um, especially in a run up to an election or a legislative action or some kind of political action. And what I would do um, if I was a political consultant or, or a, 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 um, a campaign manager running a ballot initiative, just as an example, um, you know, I would look at a voter file and I would call the voters on the voter file and I'd find out how they're going to vote. I take everybody who said, yeah, I'm absolutely going to vote yes for the library. I put them in nice, neat um, pile on my desk. I would take this 26% and I'd throw them away and I'd hope they never heard from me again. And the money that I would spend on the campaign would be spent targeting this middle 37% um, and changing their minds. It is so expensive and so resource heavy and takes such a momentous amount of time to move somebody from a no to a yes um, that we would, we would be uh, uh, much more strategically correct to move uh, to, to identify our guesses and then move those people who are likely to change their minds first. If I had more money, if I got, you know, if I if I spent money, I did really good work on the middle 37% and moved a, a lot of them up, then I would start talking to that 26%. Um, uh, and this is the same if we're if we're doing some kind of legislative work, you know, I'll talk about surfacing later on. Um, uh, but this is all the same, uh, whether it's a political action, fundraising campaign, voters, legislative work, um, whatever we're trying to do. Now watch what happens though, from 2008 to 2018, I think this should terrify everybody, but we lost 10% of our definitely vote yes uh, community. Um, our universe of voters who would definitely vote yes is down 10%. Our universe of voters that are likely to vote yes, that are likely to vote yes, has gone down 5%, which means there are 42% of Americans who are unlikely to vote um, uh, who are unlikely to vote in favor of taxes for the library. Now, this, I this is especially devastating in places like California, where you need a super majority to win an election, which means, uh, you know, you can only have a community where 36% of them are likely to vote against the library, or you're going to lose because you need 66.6% .6 of the voters to win an election in California, right? Um, and so we really, really need to be aware of this. Um, and we really need to be building messages that help drive up support. We need to be doing it in a very data-driven way. Um, a lot of libraries are trying to do it on their own. They're trying to do it individually. I think um, that's very interesting, um, but I don't think libraries are spending enough money on messaging. Um, you know, I said that the... Uh, um, the, the organizations like uh, presidential campaigns, I mean, they're spending nearly a billion dollars just on messaging on digital, you know. Um, we see organizations like Moms for Liberty raising millions and millions of dollars um, and going after libraries. We, like, whatever libraries are spending, it's not enough. We need associations to step up um, from, you know, our local associations, cooperatives to our state associations and to our national associations in order to start changing this issue. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about how to do that throughout this session. But remember like, you know, our, our goal right now is, is to move that middle 31% up to the uh, definitely vote yes category. So let's look at some voter attitudes. Let's expand on this a little bit. Um, and let's start talking about some of the messaging that we're doing now in some of our communities. You know, we have programs like Libraries Transform or Geek the Library that tell people very nice things about libraries, um, which I think is very nice. However, um, what we're seeing with that kind of uh, advocacy is that the positive image of the library has increased because we're telling people very good things about the library, but the willingness to vote for it has decreased. And that's largely because uh, liking a library and, and willing to tax yourself on behalf of a library is a very different conversation. Uh, you know, everybody likes libraries. Nobody wants to pay for them. You, know, you, you run a campaign. I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody say Jeff Bezos should pay for them. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've heard, uh, uh, you know, that they love libraries, but 
Um, they don't believe in taxes and they don't trust the government. We are a tax funded government organization. So that's really where we're getting hit. Um, and if we look at the data on this, you know, from the 2008, again, awareness to funding study, they looked and is the first longitudinal study looking at voter support for libraries. But we have these super supporters. Um, uh, we lost 0.6% of our super supporters, um, but they are 16% less likely to vote for their library. Our super supporters are less likely. They use libraries as often as they did before. They rate librarians more positively and they rate librarians more positively. Um, and, and I think that's very interesting because uh, there's a disconnect between rating librarians positively and voting for them. Again, these are different conversations and we need to be thinking about how they're different conversations as we're building our messaging. If we look at the next tier down, it says probable supporters. You know, we lost 6% of probable supporters. They are 10%, 11% less likely to vote for us. They don't use libraries as often as they did before, but they rate librarians as positively as they did before. They rate, rate libraries as positively as they did before. They rate librarians less positively. Um, and that's quite honestly a lot be, due to a lot of uh, the discussions that are happening in some political arenas around um, uh, you know, government workers, quite honestly. But also uh, we see some discussions around how the workers in the library don't reflect the communities that they serve. And that I think is, is an interesting topic, not one that we are gonna address or solve in this, in this session, um, but that, that leads to a lot of discussion around um, uh, how do we diversify our workforce, right? Um, so that they are more reflective of the communities that they're serving. And this list goes on, but the results are, fair, are, are pretty much the same. People like us, they're less likely to vote for us though. Um, we look at this data, um, and again, it's from 2018, and I'm really worried that this data point right here is changing, but political party uh, in 2018 didn't matter when it came to voter support for libraries. I do believe that thanks to the millions of dollars that are being spent attacking libraries by um, far-right organizations that this is going to change, um, uh, but I don't have data on that yet, okay? Um, but the moderate majority of Americans are just as likely to vote for or against libraries. And in fact, when we see, when we talk about things like book banning, even the moderate majority of Americans are against book banning, over 75% of Americans are against book banning. Um, and so that includes people from both sides of the spectrum. But for the large part, political party isn't one of the biggest influences as to whether or not somebody votes for or against the library. The other thing that doesn't matter is library card statistics. So the number of people in your community that, that have a library card has no impact or bearing on whether or not they support it. It has no bearing or impact as to whether or not your campaign will win or lose, um, whether or not they'll take action through signing petitions or doing other ac actions on your behalf. The number of people who use the library just doesn't matter when it comes to voter support. Um, and we'll talk about some issues that we see around that. The one thing that, that does matter um, is people's belief in their relationship about librarians um, and library workers. Uh, and I use the word librarian to mean everybody who, to mean what the public refers to as a librarian, which is anybody who is in, in any way related to the library, right? So um, friends groups, foundations, um, all of those kinds of organizations, as far as the public concern, our librarians, I don't care about changing their perception on that, as long as that builds trust and lines of communication with the library. Um, I'll talk about voter, uh, I'll talk about, about supporters in just a minute, but uh, this is really because relational supporters are your strongest supporters. These are the people that you call first, the people who you know, the people who have relationships with you, those are the people who you would fundraise from, right? Um, you know, if you're a fundraiser, you have relational supporters, uh, you have ideological supporters, you have aversion supporters, um, uh, and you have one more that I'm totally forgetting, access supporters, right? Um, which we'll talk about later on. Um, but the most, the, the, the strongest level of support that you have is from your relational supporters. And those are the people who you know, and the people who, who know you, and you have lines of communication and you have uh, trust built with them, okay? Um, so that's why the, the single most important thing that matters to influence people's belief about libraries is their relationship to the librarian. So 
even if you don't take a lot away from this this whole session on messaging, the one thing that I want you to take away in order to build support for libraries in your community is to go out and make friends with as many people as you can. Um, that's quite honestly the most significant way that you can build support in your community. Um, all this messaging stuff I think is interesting. It's very good for ideological supporters. It's good for helping you to establish those, those relationships by knowing what talking points to use when you're speaking with legislators or other individuals. But um, getting out and talking to people is the most important thing that you can do. Now, what does this all mean? Uh, well, since 98% of library funding is political in nature and because our jobs are dependent upon that funding and because we are the ones who are most influential in gaining support for that funding as librarians, our library workers, then whether or not we like it, we are political candidates for our job and we need to be learning from political candidates um, and how they engage with the community, how they build support, um, how they understand supporters um, and how they engage with them and empower them to take actions on, on behalf of those issues or their candidates, right? Um, does anybody have any questions about any of that? Okay, so we're gonna start going into some of the details around messaging again. Um, for those of you who, who showed up a little bit late, we have, um, uh, uh, this is an uh, extremely full session. So if you have any questions, feel free to you know comment, feel free to interject. Um, we can have conversations about any of the things in here um, uh, and we can do some sharing and, and groundwork and that kind of thing as well. So um let's get into messaging let's get into how we actually do it so we have our current messaging model in librarianship it's very one directional we want to tell people nice things about libraries um and we want them to then like libraries right libraries transform posters above the drinking fountain calling it advocacy here's a bunch of nice things to say about libraries um it's one directional right you don't get a lot back from that so let's say um uh let's say that you know, you put up a library's transform poster. What happens next? Uh, you know, some miracle happens, and then funding comes, right? And that's that's kind of what gets sold to us quite a bit in um, in a lot of the advocacy that we're doing. You know, if you put bar coasters in a bunch of bars around the community that say nice things about libraries, everybody will support you. If you put up billboards, everybody will support you. But that's not necessarily how it works. You really have to engage with the community in a way that is um, not necessarily a transaction, but is a dialogue. Um, uh, you want to ensure that you are having conversations with your community in which you get things back from that activity. So I'm not telling, I'm not suggesting that you throw out your library's transform posters, but what I am suggesting is that, you know, if you have a poster up that says, uh, uh, you know, I think one of them says something like, because you can't afford textbooks on a ramen noodle diet, don't throw the poster out, put something up on it that says, if you believe in this, follow us on Facebook, like us on Twitter, sign up for our email list, write a letter to the editor, make a donation, volunteer. Um, uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But that is how you start getting things back. Um, that is how you start building this cycle. Um, and again, we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit more in depth here. Uh, the reason that this is important is because if your messaging is profitable, if you're getting more donations back than you are um, spending on your advocacy materials, you should be making money in, in your advocacy. Um, you know, the reason that we're seeing the rise of organizations like Moms for Liberty or a lot of these other scam packs that are around that are um, primarily built to uh, engage the public towards donations so that they can pay their officers and other individuals significant amounts of money. Um, as because, it's because a lot of organizations on the right have figured out how to make money from their messaging. Um, it is a monetary machine. Um, they figured out how to make their messaging um, profitable. They've figured out how to do calls to action in ways that um, rally the public and drive up support and get people to come out and take action. I mean, they do that largely through these calls to action, right? So on my example, the Libraries Transform poster, putting that, um, you know, you, if you have a great statement about libraries, if you have a great message about libraries, which we'll talk about building in just a minute, 
um, you know, the key to that messaging is what do they do after they hear it? Um, uh, messaging alone isn't going to save you. You know, we hear that the number one question I get asked when I talk to a library campaign is what message can I tell the public so they'll all support us? And there's really, there's really no message. I, if there was, I mean, I would hope that I would have found it. We could have been done with advocacy a long time ago if there's a message that did something like that, but there's not. Um, what gets people to take action um, is asking them to. And if you're if you're putting materials out that don't take uh, uh, that don't call people to action, that doesn't identify your supporters, that doesn't help you build the resources that you need, um, time, money, and people, then. Um, you know, it's not effective messaging. You shouldn't be spending your time or energy or money doing it. Um, you know, if, if you're not putting donate buttons on the bottom of Facebook um, posts, if you're not um, uh, uh, asking people to take the next action, if you're not identifying them, putting them in, in your, your email list or building your email list, um, you know, I wouldn't spend time and energy doing messaging if you're not going to do the stuff that actually engages them and, and gets people to activate and take action. Um, messaging alone isn't going to save us. It's what do people do after they hear the message that's going to save us. And we're going to talk more about that too. Um, when we look at what libraries are doing right now, this is another uh, uh, research piece from OCLC. I forgot the name of the study, um, uh, but, it was a, but it was basically a marketing study. Um, to see what libraries were doing with their communications. If we look at, at, at what libraries want to do with their communication, it's increased community awareness of the library, increased use of library, increased participation, increase uh, 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 to the library in person, increased traffic to the library in person. Um, and those are all fine, but if we're talking about building support, um, you know, and we know that library use doesn't matter. Why are we spending so much time and money on increasing library awareness, support, participation, traffic, et cetera? Um, I've worked in libraries that had almost nobody, uh, uh, that almost nobody in the community used, but they were, they were extremely well-funded because the public had a good relationship to the library, because they believed in the library, because they supported the library. It had nothing to do with whether or not they used it, right? Um, for example, like Portola Valley Library, I was the branch manager there for a while. Um, they spent millions and millions and millions of dollars building uh, an incredibly gorgeous library. Um, but Portola Valley is one of the wealthiest areas in all of Silicon Valley. Nobody there needs to use the library and they don't use the library. They just believe in the importance of a library. Um, so, you know, if I was spending money on increasing participation or library use, that might not be the, 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 the best use of my dollars. Um, uh, I, I might want to um, spend my messaging resources on increasing donations, on engaging with volunteers, um, on some persuasion. But ultimately, uh, ultimately I want to build support. Um, I want to build political power and influence for my library. Um, and political power and influence only comes from two places, and that is people and that is money. Um, an organization that doesn't have any money uh, doesn't have any political power. An organization that doesn't have any people doesn't have any political power. Um, you have to have one of those two things in order to have it. The big problem with libraries, of course, is that we don't have money and people. Um, every library is the only organization in the country that's been building a national voter file for librarians. Um, we're the only organization that is taking the time to identify and build uh, lists of library supporters um, so that we can use them when libraries are threatened. So, um, uh, you know, you see this in use all the time from political campaigns to candidates to issues. You know, if we look at um, Planned Parenthood, one of their big activities is identifying who their supporters are. So that way, if an, if a legislator threatens, um, you know, abortion rights, they can immediately send out a million emails to the voters in that legislator's district and apply pressure to that legislator, right? They've built a, a, um, a, a reward and a, a benefit and consequence system for legislators to support uh, abortion rights or women's health care 
issues or men's health care issues, Planned Parenthood, I guess, really does it all. But, um, uh, you know, they by by using their marketing dollars to identify individuals willing to take action on their on their behalf and by using messaging dollars on increasing donations, they're able to use those resources in order to uh, uh, engage more in a more sophisticated manner with the political machine, right? Um, they're able to use dollars and money to make campaign contributions, to move legislation forward. Uh, they're able to use their, their, their databases of people to show support for legislation that they wanna move forward. Um, and that's really what we need to be doing with our messaging. Um, and we can do it in a bunch of different ways. Uh, uh, this is part of a ladder of engagement. Uh, and what we're doing with a ladder of engagement, you know, it's not a sales cycle like we're seeing from, you know, in the early 2000s, late 90s, we had a lot big movement in libraries to follow um, uh, business best practices. Um, private business best, best practices, like how is a Walmart targeting? How is Pepsi doing marketing? Um, but, you know, we're not getting people to buy something. We don't, our, our, our money isn't based on whether or not somebody uses us. Our, our money is based on whether or not somebody supports us. And so it's not a sales cycle, um, getting somebody to use us more or, you know, we're not getting people to buy Pepsi doesn't bring us money, right? That way it does for Pepsi. Um, so on a ladder of engagement, what we have here is, is a, a group of people who are unaware. We target them with messaging um, and calls to action that make them become observers. Follow us on Facebook. You know, here's a great message about libraries. Here's why you should believe in libraries. Here's the next action that you can take if you believe in libraries. That next action to move them from unaware to observers would be something like sign up for our email list, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. Um, that makes them more active observers of what we're doing. Um, once we have them as observers, um, we can start looking at um, data around them to understand the messages that they believe in. Um, and then we can start targeting them with, with messages that are that is more sophisticated, um, that is data driven, that targets people to attach people's beliefs to the messages that we're telling them, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And that drives them to become supporters, right? Every time they associate you know, if they, if they think they, they care about education in the community, um, we're going to talk to them about how the library supports education in the community, right? And that helps move people up to supporters. Once we have people up to supporters, um, you know, we start making the bigger asks of them, uh, make a donation, volunteer, write a letter to the editor, sign a petition, take those concrete actions to support us, um, or take a leadership role within our advocacy system, um, uh, you know, do they want to start a, a local organization uh, like the Florida Freedom to Read people? Um, do they want to, uh, you know, help us engage with fundraising or engage with more people in the public? Like those are the people who are advocates, are the people who are doing those kinds of activities for libraries. Um, but this is the basic structure of how messaging works and how it should be thought of and, and how it's just simply a tool to move people through this ladder of engagement. Now getting to how messaging works, um, you know, I think one of the big issues that we see in librarianship is that we are telling the public what we want the public to know about libraries. And what we need to be doing is telling the public what the public wants to hear about libraries. What do they wanna hear from us? Um, what, do they, what issues do they care about? And how is the library a part of a solution to fixing that problem? Or, um, or, or supporting um, activities that they think should, should be greater or should continue in the community. So for example, you know, I'm gonna keep picking on Libraries Transform just because I think people are, are familiar with it. Um, I'm not against Libraries Transform in any way. Um, but you know, it is a method of advocacy where we're telling everybody everything about libraries. Um, and if we took a more data-driven approach to this and we looked at um, uh, segmenting audiences, say, on Facebook to create, to create um, uh, numbers of people who care about education, because you can look up, you can create an ad audience of everybody who cares about education on Facebook, then you can start targeting them with libraries transform content um, about education, right? We want to solidify um, uh, the idea that libraries support education in their mind to such an extent that if they think, you know, we need to fix education in this community, the first thing they're going to think of is supporting the library, 
right? Um, it's very difficult to get somebody to care about education who doesn't, who get somebody who cares about the economy or public safety um, or literacy or any of the other things that libraries do in a community. It's hard to get them to care about those issues. It's much easier to uh, uh, run those issues through their already held beliefs and ideologies, um, especially when that data exists to create those audiences, right? Um, uh, a good message is only as good as its audience. Um, you cannot, if, if you create the most amazing message in the world, but you don't tell the right people about it, nothing's gonna happen. You aren't gonna get the engagement, you aren't gonna get the, the, the actions, you aren't gonna get people to do the things that you need them to do without having the right audiences. Um, this is something that political campaigns know very, very well. In fact, Donald Trump's campaign through Cambridge Analytica had over 1,600 independent and unique ad audiences that they used, that they targeted with uh, messages that resonated with those individuals through formats that those individuals interacted with. So I know to talk to you know uh, Patrick Sweeney about education through Facebook ads because he clicks on Facebook ads or um, because he, he engages in email, I send him emails or direct mail. We know all those things about these individuals. So we're able to target them with those messages through the mediums that they that they interact with. Um, this is the this is really the back uh, on the back end of what messaging is and what mes makes messaging work. Messaging simply doesn't work if you're trying to create a message to tell everyone, or if you're not going to use that message in a way that it, it gets put in front of people who care about that message. It's just not going to work. You're going to have spent significant time and energy and money, um, and you're just not going to get the results that, that you want. Um, remember that that messaging is only part of the puzzle. Um, uh, when we look at the other influencers of messaging, um, you know, people of various classes, races, genders, religions, who go to different workplaces, schools, different political parties, who follow different opinion leaders, all have different ideas. Um, uh, different messages are going to work with these different groups of people. One of the things that I see that I think we see a lot of in libraries is that we typically have five ad audiences in, in libraries, and that is um, children, teens, adults, seniors, and parents. Um, but people are far more nuanced than that. We need to have messages that resonate with Republicans, with Democrats, um, uh, that engage with different opinion leaders. Um, because if we if we can engage with different opinion leaders, you know, if we got if we got you know hypothetically if we got Tucker Carlson to run something really favorable about libraries on his show. Um, uh, you know, we would probably have a lot more uh, conservative support for libraries. And since 80% of our libraries are in um, uh, uh, Republican areas, uh, library systems, not individual libraries, library systems are in Republican areas, I think that's something that we need to really, really start looking at. Like most libraries serve rural, rural communities who tend to lean more conservative. Um, so we need to think about that when we're engaging with the public, right? Um, and I'll talk about that too in just a little bit. Um, audience segmentation needs to happen um, at a much more sophisticated level. You know, we need to know how do homeowners feel about libraries. We need to know how uh, uh, sci-fi readers, you know, care about libraries. Wealthy people care about libraries. We need to know how uh, poor people or impoverished people or or highly educated or undereducated people feel about libraries. And understanding that in all those different demographics is going to help us craft messages that resonate with those different demographics, right? This data work has never, ever, ever been done in librarianship. Um, this is why I say awareness to funding was extremely interesting, but not necessarily useful. Um, because it told us a lot about voter support for libraries, but it didn't tell us who to talk to, and it didn't really tell us what to talk to them about. There's, there wasn't good, there wasn't data in there that was strong enough to help me segment my audiences to tell the right people the right messages through the right mediums at the right time, uh, in order to engage them in a way that gets them to do to take some favorable action on behalf of libraries, and that's really, really what we need to 
need to do. We have quite literally no data on this. Um, and it should be very, very terrifying to us. Um, uh, we've never built voter models. We never built national donor models. We never built a national voter file for libraries. Um, without doing those things, uh, we are really, really behind. Um, like 30, 40, 50 years behind what's happening in advocacy across the country. Um, you know, if you look at um, uh, the major organizations, the major parties, the major issues, they have huge data sets on every American voter. Um, they understand what those voters care about. They understand what engages them, what gets them to take action. They know how to talk to them about those things we don't. Um, you know, if we look at fossil fuels, if we look at the police, I think the police are a great parallel to us. You know, the police get away with a lot of advocacy that librarians won't do. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've worked with a library, uh, a municipal library, who told me they couldn't advocate for themselves, but, um, you know, the police were doing all those things, you know, um, and they're guided by the same rules that libraries are. They have the same advocacy rules that libraries have. Um, we are allowed to do things that the police do in order to advocate for themselves in the same way the police have set the precedent, right? They're very good at advocating for themselves. Um, uh, and they have a lot of this data um, for themselves. Um, if we look at, you know, organizations like um, uh, uh, the, the Koch brothers, um, I'm totally blanking on the name of their political action committee. Um, in any case, um, they have they have data on every single American voter. Um, if we look at NRA to Planned Parenthood, Human Rights Campaign, Sierra Club, they have huge, huge data sets on Americans. Um, libraries have none of that. We have access to none of that. Um, so this is something that I think is really important. Now, what I'm not talking about is a Cambridge Analytica approach to advocacy. Um, I'm not talking about stealing people's data. Um, if you haven't looked up who Cambridge Analytica is, um, you know, there's a great documentary on Netflix about it. Anyway, um, uh, they stole a whole bunch of data and, and all Cambridge Analytica was doing was stealing that data in order to determine who was in that yes, no, or maybe um, data set. You know, like who is who are their absolutely yes supporters, who are their no supporters, and who are their maybe supporters so that they could target those maybe supporters with messaging that influenced them to become their yeses, you know, um, because that is the most expensive and time consuming aspect of a campaign. If they can reduce that cost then they can spend more money on, on persuading the yes that, or the, the maybes, right? Um, and so that's what Cambridge Analytica is doing. Now, I'm not talking about stealing people's data. I'm also not talking about violating people's privacy. I'm talking about opt-ins. I'm talking about people who have agreed to be contacted about the importance and relevance of libraries. Um, I want people who are engaged. Um, you know, I want to follow good GDPR rules. I think if you're not familiar with GDPR, um, GDPR are the rules that govern um, data in the UK. I think they are um, not just really good, not just a really good piece of legislation, but it's good data practice to follow GDPR, even though we don't have to in the United States. Um, uh, GDPR really guarantees people's privacy um, with their data and their ownership over their data. I think that's incredibly important. Um, what we need to be doing is building these data sets, and we can do that through some polling and big data. And I'm going to talk about talk quite a bit about um, uh, uh, about how to do that as we go through the session. Um, and I'm, I'm going I'm to show you the data that we have from our book banning um, public opinion poll that we did that helped us get data that was useful um, around um, book banning. We're going to do that case study at the end of this session. Uh, does anybody have any questions about any of this so far? Good stuff. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, great. Great. Um, please jump out and say anything that, that you like. Um, all right, so let's talk about getting the message out a little bit um, and some of the things that the guiding principles that kind of matter. Um, one of the first things that matter is a sense of urgency. Um, why this issue? Why now? Um, uh, you know, if you put out uh, a message that doesn't have an end date, if you don't have um, do this by this date, if it could be done at any time, um, then people will do it at any time. They won't do it now. We need people to take action now. 
So when you're doing messages and you're building your calls to action, always make sure that you have, you know, we need to get this done by December 31st at midnight or else blah, 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 blah. You know, um, if you are on any political candidates email list, you're going to get these emails. And I'm, I'm on everybody's email list from the left to the right. So like I get, um, I get uh, Don Trump Jr.'s frantic emails at, um, you know, 6 p.m. at night about how he just talked to his dad about me. And I'm one of the great ultra mega supporters. If I just give $5 today, he'll put in a good word with me for his dad or whatever, you know, like this crazy stuff. But it's all about creating a sense of urgency. It's about creating um, uh, a deadline. So people have to have to get it done by a certain time. Um, that's what drives people to donate. That's what people drives people to take action on messages is that sense of urgency, right? And along with that sense of urgency is timing. Um, putting a message out too late is going to cost a lot more. Um, and at the left-hand bottom corner of this diagram is say when um, an issue arises, a, 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 an issue originally arises. So for example, um, when we saw Trump cutting um, federal funding for IMLS, when that, that, that budget came out, um, people were outraged immediately. Um, and so what needed to happen was that um, libraries need to get a, a petition out. They need to get something out to the public because both the library industry and a lot of members of the public were outraged that Trump would cut federal funding for libraries. Um, uh, and the sooner you put that out, the sooner you catch this upswing on, on this engagement. So as people get more and more outraged about something and more and more, and more people learn about something, um, they're outraged for a short amount of time until the next thing to be outraged happens, right? Um, if you don't catch them in this upswing, then the cost of then the cost of engaging them increases. Um, so the more time that goes by, the more time or the more money it costs to get people to take action on something that happened, you know, three, six months ago, nine months ago. This timing, this timing, I think, is really important. You know, when we when Trump first cut IMLS funding, we put our petition up within, I think, 48 hours at every library. Uh, but some of our, our associations, you know, they weren't going to have their first meeting about it for three or four months. Um, and that's largely because of the budgetary cycle in Congress, et cetera. That makes sense if you're doing the, the legislative work. But if you're doing the field work, if you're engaging the public, if you're trying to engage the public to support you and take action on your behalf, you have to give them that opportunity when they're outraged. Otherwise, they just aren't going to care. It's going to cost you a lot more money to get your message heard. Um, uh, and organizations that are getting their message heard are going to be the ones that are heard, even if they're in opposition to you, right? So uh, that timing is really, really important. Um, along with that timing, uh, what is even more important, I think, is this idea of surfacing. Um, surfacing your message means that you start messaging years before you need the public to take action. Um, you want to build a messaging framework for the public so that later on when you need them to act, they will know why they're acting. Um, so we see this in um, presidential campaigns. You know, we see presidential candidates showing up at the Iowa State Fair two years before they're running. You know, when we start seeing Right now, we're seeing um, a lot of political grandstanding from like uh, uh, DeSantis and, and Greg Abbott. Uh, they're doing a lot of big, dramatic, huge things in order to raise their profile, um, in order to uh, uh, set their name up on the, on the national stage, tell their story um, in their own words. Because once they start running for president, uh, everybody's going to be... Uh, looking at them with a much more critical eye. So the longer that you can tell somebody something uh, before you have to ask them something, the more likely they are, A, to give it to you, but B, believe whatever it is that you're telling them. If you're telling somebody something in order to get something from them immediately, they're less likely to believe for you. If you're like uh, showing up just when you go to the voters, uh, you know that's when we see some problems. This is something that I think the uh, MAGA... Republicans are doing very, very well. Um, if you look at democratic engagement with rural communities um, in between election cycles, it's almost nothing. Um, Trump was having rallies there his entire presidency. It was the first time 
that rural America felt like they were heard. It was the first time that they felt like they were listened to. It was the first time that they felt like somebody showed up for them because Trump showed up for them. You know, like we see Biden show up during the campaign cycle, the other two years that he's, that he's like, he hasn't been to Iowa or those places at any meaningful level in between election cycles, right? Um, uh, he's going to need their support later on, but he hasn't surfaced himself within those communities in such a way that he's um, uh, positioned himself as somebody who cares about them, right? He, he's going to need that messaging structure later. So, you know, if we're running a, 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 a campaign for libraries, you know, let's, we need to start it today. If you're going to the voters five years from now, 10 years from now, if you have a legislative ask that you want to make five years from now, 10 years from now, start planning on it right now. Um, uh, start putting that messaging into the community right now, because if you don't, somebody else will. Um, uh, you know, if, if there is a vacuum of messaging, somebody will fill that space with nonsense. And that's really what we're seeing is that is in, in a lot of um, the political messaging worlds, you know, libraries weren't talking enough about um, uh, reasons not to ban books. They weren't having conversations with the public about the role of taxes and library government or, um, uh, you know, the things that the public needs to know um, in order to run a campaign from. So you see things that happen in a campaign where, you know, they're, they're, they're going to the voters to build a new library, but they never really told the voters what the, the, the cost of the new library is. So somebody on some post on Nextdoor or some other platform wrote, the library is going to cost, you know, $2 million. Uh, and that's going to be fact in the community from then on, um, because the library didn't spend the time, attention, money, resources, whatever, on telling the public exactly what that library was going to cost. The public made up a number. And now that number is, number is gospel. Um, we see that happen all the time. Um, you know, having the answers to the to the questions that the public are going to have when you ask them for something, um, already have those questions answered before you go to ask them something. Um, don't let somebody else answer it for you. Um, uh, get that message out as early and often as you can. Okay. Um, so there's actually a really great case study on surfacing happening right now. Um, this comes from um, uh, from the Americans for Prosperity. Now I remember the Koch brothers pack name. But what Americans for Prosperity, and again, we've gone to their conferences, so we know this is what we're doing because they're very upfront about the fact that this is what they're doing. Um, but uh, Americans for Prosperity's primary agenda is to eliminate certifications for professions. So you don't need a certification to be a barber, a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, all of those are unnecessary government regulations um, that are burdening Americans or whatever, right? So, um, you know, they believe that a, a bad doctor will get run out of the market because his patients will die or whatever. Um, uh, but uh, in the meantime, a bunch of their patients die, right? So it's a very preposterous solution. Anyway, it doesn't matter. What, what, what we're seeing happen is they're surfacing this narrative within the progressive community that, uh, that these kinds of regulations um, burdens uh, uh, marginalized groups, minority groups, um, uh, and they're using very progressive language in order to put the messaging out. So right now they're, they're, they're going out and they're finding um, hair braiders. Um, they found them in Georgia. Uh, North Carolina, um, Idaho, um, primarily black hair braiders who are hiring uncertified, unlicensed people in their in their hair braiding um, uh, salons um, uh, and, and paying them you know minimum wage because they're uncertified or whatever. Um, any any case that the, the government of course is slapping them with fines. If you've ever been to if you've ever done anything around um, cosmetology, a lot of a lot of the the, the the training in cosmetology is around safety, health, that kind of thing. Um, that's really what the certification is, is about. In any case, um, so the government fined um, this woman for hiring unlicensed hair braiders, um, even though I'm sure all the hair braiders knew how to braid hair just fine. Um, and, and so they're writing up these reports in primarily Black and progressive publications about how um, the Black community is being um, uh, burdened with these regulations 
it wouldn't be great if we decertified um, uh, 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 licensing or, or licensing requirements for cosmeto cosmetology or whatever, right? Um, so later on, when they say, when they come to the progressive community and they say, we're going to start eliminating um, these licensing, the progressive community is going to be like, oh yeah, absolutely, because it, it's, 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 it's a significant burden on mar marginalized or minority communities or whatever, 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 right? Um, and if you click on the authors on a lot of these articles, you'll see they're from like the Heritage Foundation or um, PragerU or their fellows at some of these far right organizations. Um, so I so thinking about this in, in terms of libraries, uh, I think it helps to have an example out of libraries, but to think about this in terms of libraries, you know, one of the big issues that we had, for example, with uh, when we got rid of the um, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder Award. Um, when libraries eliminated the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award, they just came out, said it, it got picked up on Breitbart. Um, if, you, if you've ever been to rural America, Laura Ingalls Wilder is a saint. You don't touch her, you don't mess with her, um, but people went ballistic, right? And that was because as an industry, we didn't spend significant time educating the public about why we might wanna change that, the name of that award. And, and it costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of resources, but the outcome is that the people are on our side. Like if we spent, if we wrote some articles, if we if we co-opted some conservative language around it, if we uh, built those kinds of messages and, and built that messaging infrastructure, so that later on when we said, "Here's our ask," we're changing the name of the Lord Ingalls Wilder Award, the majority of Americans would be like, "Oh yeah," because you know uh, of the problematic language, of the way it represents Native Americans, blah blah blah, blah all that kind of stuff, right? Um, same thing with Drag Queen Story Hour, programs like Drag Queen Story Hour. The communities that we see Drag Queen Story Hour fail in are communities that weren't ready to have Drag Queen Story Hour um, uh, uh, culturally, societally, whatever. Um, you can do things like Drag Queen Story Hour, but you have to prepare the community with better messaging. Um, you have to humanize the performers. You have to you have to allow access to uh, uh, maybe more adults in the beginning, um, and and to help alleviate whatever fears the public has about Drag Queen Story Hour. You have to deal with those those each individually um, in a very resource heavy way, so that when you actually do Drag Queen Story Hour, um, the public understands what it is and why it is. Yeah. Um, if we're doing messaging, um, we need to understand the language that we're using. So we're going to get really into now, how do we build some messaging and, and some tools for building some messaging? I think one of the most important things that we need to understand is that the language that libraries use to promote libraries is very progressive in nature. And that's almost entirely because 78% uh, uh, of librarians are registered on the progressive side of politics. Um, which means we have a very progressive language about libraries, but libraries aren't very progressive organizations. They are very conservative organizations. They just sound progressive because that's the way we've talked about them. But if you look at things like the Dewey Decimal System, like nearly 10% of the Dewey Decimal System is dedicated to like Western Christianity, you know? So when we hear all this rhetoric about they're limiting Bibles in the library, you know, they're not allowed to be Christians in the library. It's like, well, no, I mean, it's a very, it's a very Western Christian organization, like even down to the way we organize our books, right? Um, you know, if I, for example, tell my dad that I help connect poor people to government services, he's going to go ballistic. But if I tell my dad that I am going to um, help, help uh, poor people pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get back to work, he's going to be fully on board. However, what didn't change at all, either way I said that, is the work in the library. The work that we do in the library doesn't change either way. We just represent it to the uh, audiences that we're speaking to using a language that we understand. Um, because we're really seeing like a Tower of Babel moment in American in just American society where, where conservatives and progressives can't even have a conversation with each other because the language that they're using is so different. You know, if I, if I say marginalized communities, um, uh, to somebody on the right, they're going to blow me off and talk about CRT or whatever other nonsense, right? Um, uh, if I talk about, I don't know, whatever, on, if, if I use conservative language to a progressive, the progressive is going to be turned off as well, right? So we see, it, we see it playing out both ways. So we have to learn how to speak these political languages. And there's a great book um, but called The Three Languages of Politics, where they talk about progressive, conservative, and libertarian. 
Um, and I highly recommend this book. Um, the, the book is written by Alan Kling, um, but he really dives into the differences between, um, uh, between these languages of politics. Going beyond that, uh, I wanna give some more book recommendations, but uh, you know, George Lakoff is a progressive um, cognitive scientist um, who talks about the way progressives interact with language and messaging. Frank Luntz is a conservative. Um, uh, uh, he's, he's not he's not a cognitive scientist. He is uh, like a social scientist, but he runs a lot of political polling. Um, he runs a lot of message building and stuff like that. So um, this is a conservative side of the same thing. So I highly recommend these two books to read, as well as Alan Kling's The Three Languages of Politics um, to understand those languages. So let's talk about how do we start building some messaging a little bit more formally. So there's, th there's, there's five C's of messaging. Um, number one, it has to be contrasting. Um, the message that you are putting out in the community has to contrast with your opposition. If not, if it doesn't contrast with your opposition, then why would people choose you over them if, if it's exactly the same, right? Um, what does a library do that's different than anybody else? How does the library impact a community that's different than anybody else? How, how is the library doing things that nobody else in the community can do, right? Those are all good contrasting um, conversations to have. It has to be convincing. Obviously, don't, don't over promise and under deliver. Um, don't promise on, on things you can't, uh, don't make promises you can't keep. Libraries aren't gonna cure cancer. Um, you know, uh, uh, we're not gonna do these, these huge giant things, um, you know, of course, outside the scope of librarianship. So make sure that what you're saying is very convincing and true to what libraries actually do. Make sure your messaging is consistent. Um, you know, uh, don't tell somebody that something costs a million dollars because you think that's what they want to hear and then go out and tell somebody else that something costs two million dollars because you think that's what they want to hear. Um, eventually, uh, people will figure that out and you will get blasted for uh, being dishonest. And we've seen libraries do that a number of times. Um, library directors who talk to one group and make one set of promises and talk to another group and make an, an opposite set of promises, uh, you know, gets called out on some social media platform somewhere. Um, please don't do that. Make sure that your, your messages are concise. The shorter, the better. Um, the reason that saying the word CRT, um, critical race theory, the reason that saying um, uh, groomer, uh, or these, you know, they've, they've redefined these clear and concise and short messages and, and weaponized them and turned them against us. Um, uh, and this is, and, and they're going out and they're identifying words that the public has in their mind that through data and polling um, and all of that other work that we we're talking about in the first half of this session to find words that are succinct, um, uh, that capture the essence of something and then they're they're pushing on that that concise messaging, um, and then and then of course make sure that your your what your messaging is is very clear, uh, making sure that you're writing at a third and fourth grade level. Um, that I think is the most difficult part for librarians. Uh, the more simplistic you can make it, the the better your messaging is going to be. Um, as easy as it is for people to understand. Um, uh, the easier it is for people to understand, the quicker they're going to understand, the, the faster they're going to take action on your behalf. Um, so those are very, very important. Excuse me one second. Sorry about that. So making sure that we're talking about stories and not stats. Um, people uh, emotionally connect themselves to stories um, and highlighting. Um, and what we're seeing from this is, you know, uh, um, so, so I mean, the way we can kind of talk about this is this is an image of Joe the Plumber. Um, Joe the Plumber was talking about the national debt, but nobody can really tell me what the national debt was in 2008 when he was talking about it. Nobody remembers that. But uh, everybody still to this day remembers Joe the Plumber. You know, he was a story... Uh, that hit everything. The, 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 the thing that we're really seeing the right get very good at when they're coming after libraries is highlighting um, two or three stories of impact and presenting it as if that is 
uh, the case across the board. So, uh, you know, over 1600 books have been banned, but they've been banned based on um, three or four examples of books from gender queer, all boys aren't blue, blue is die, um, you know, wh wh whatever other one is lawn boy or whatever is the other one that they're upset about right now. Um, but there's only a handful of books that contain the content that they that that they believe is is um, inappropriate or um, objectionable or obscene, even though it doesn't pass the Miller test for any of those things. Um, so, uh, and but they're promoting those five books over and over and over and over again in order to um, get people to trust them to ban the other, you know. Uh, 1,595, 995 books that they're trying to ban. Um, so like, how, how do we tell stories about a lot of these other books? We're going to talk about that a bit in the book banning case study. Um, we look at, uh, uh, when we look at telling their stories, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're using that data-driven approach. So we want to identify an audience who's going to care about this story. We want to know what they care about, and then we want to have the story to tell them that resonates with them based on what they care about, right? What does that audience care about? Do they care about education? Let's tell them a story about a, a story of impact about education. Do they care about the economy? Let's talk about somebody who started their small business in the library, um, and let's spend a lot of time and money and energy telling that story to a lot of people, right? Um, uh, that's how you build out and deliver those stories. What's also important is the, is is being um <clears throat> so telling more about the the what or the why it is that we're doing um you know we i hear over and over campaigns like what here's what the public gets but not why the public gets it like we're going to have more literate americans in our community if our if our library you know passes this bond or whatever well why i mean how you know like we have to tell a lot more stories about children who became more literate adults who became more literate um uh, why that happened um, before we can just put stuff out like what like we've I've, I've worked on campaigns that said you know we're going to have uh, 500 more square feet of programming space well so what what happens then what happens because of that programming space what are the outcomes why do why do we need that 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 programming space and those are conversations they need to be putting out over and over and over again and spending significant time and resources um, putting out um, Something else that I don't think we do enough in this industry is A-B testing. Um, A-B testing is a method for um, uh, looking at which messages resonate with your community. Um, you can do this in a number of email platforms from Constant Contact, MailChimp, um, to Nation Builder, which is what we use. Um, uh, but A-B testing is like if you had a thousand, if you had an email list of a thousand people, you would send one email with one subject line to a hundred of those people, one email with a different subject line to the other hundred of those people, whichever one had the highest open rates, the highest click through rates, whatever your measurement of success is, that's the one that you'd send out to those other, other uh, 700 people. Um, and that's how, and by doing that over and over and over again, that's how you, that's how you test to see what messages work. Um, and you can test all kinds of stuff from the color of buttons, um uh to you know the, the writing style to all kinds of different things as long as you're just changing one thing at a time um you can see what works best to talk to your community and build and build those really strong um, emails build those really strong facebook posts facebook lets you a b test um, this is something that libraries really need to think about quite a bit the other thing um problem agitation solution a problem agitation solution is a model for building and a message that engages people to take action on your behalf. Um, problem agitation solution means that you state a problem, you agitate it by talking to the person about how it impacts them directly, not how it impacts somebody else, not how it impacts whatever, but how they are personally impacted. And then you provide the solution, which maybe vote for the library, donate to the library, volunteer for the library, sign this petition, whatever it is. If you are on any political person's uh, or or sophisticated, you know, nonprofit organizations email list. All of the emails that you get are going to be in this problem agitation solution model. Um, you know, it could be, for example, um, don't use this in your own day to day practice, but this is this is an example. You know, um, uh, state a problem. Children in this community are growing up to be illiterate. The agitation is how it impacts the individual. Well, um, children who are more 
who are elder are more likely to commit crime, which means you will get stabbed and or shot and or robbed. Unless our children are, Ill are illiterate, what's the solution? Bring your children to story time so they grow up to be more illiterate, right? Um, and then you will be safe, okay? So that's the problem, agitation solution. Don't, I mean, obviously that one's extreme, don't use it. But you can also use the positive side of this. So you can say children who grew up in a community uh, who grew up more literate um, provide more back to the community. Um, your community will make more money. You will be able to earn more, uh, earn higher wages, um be more uh economically viable etc what's the solution bring your children to story time right so that's a that's both a positive and a negative version of a um a problem agitation solution um so let's talk about this uh uh um uh, a non non-violent protest um so there was a great study um, by Erica Chenoweth from Harvard who looked at um, uh, what kinds of demonstrations um, were more likely to succeed. And what she found is that 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 or that campaigns that were less negative, um, were less violent, were less aggressive, were more likely to succeed in the long run. Um, than ones that were attacktivism that that didn't engage the public in a meaningful way, you know, that that were just violent, didn't weren't as successful. Um, the other thing that she found is that it only takes 3.5% of the public to succeed um, in a, in in a move in creating movement, um, and and I think that's very important to understand. Um, uh, uh, because we don't need to message everybody in our community. You know, we don't need to be talking to every single individual. We need to be talking to the people that care. And, oh, sorry. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Sorry about that. Um, so let's look at, let's look at our case study on, um, on messaging. Um, so let's talk, let's, let's build a, a messaging going through the data um, all the way to creating messaging that would impact the public and targeting it and everything. So um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we got um, public opinion results, public poll, public opinion polling results back nationwide on book ban, so we could understand um, book banning. We're going to have a number of trainings on this coming up for libraries across the country about how to how to build messages to combat book bans in in, in their community. Um, so what we did is we we hired a, a polling firm called Embold Research, uh, and they found some preliminary data um, just to give us an idea of the environment that we're working in. So 92% of Americans have heard something about book banning. Um, what's great about this is we know that we have a huge audience that we can engage with. Uh, we don't have to we don't have to spend a lot of money engaging people. People are aware that book banning is happening. Um, uh, ha uh, half of bullet, half of voters believe there's no time when books should be banned. Um, Forty-one percent think there are rare times, and just eight percent think there are many times that books are inappropriate and should be banned. Um, you know, thirty percent of Republicans think there's no time when a book should be banned, um, and voters are most offended by the idea that children and classic books are being banned. Um, only thirty-four percent of voters support banning books about sexuality, even though that is the the number one talking point that we're hearing from the right. Um, it's still a very small number of people who are um, uh, concerned about book banning. Now, seventy-five percent of voters will consider book banning when voting in November. I think that's important because that's good messaging that you can have for legislators. Um, but let's break this down a little bit more. So we start with this basic overall data: what is the environment in which we're operating in? What does it look like? Um, uh, and get some of this preliminary data. We can dive in a little bit deeper. We can learn more specifically about what people believe. Um, so, uh, these are some messages that we, that we have kind of tested. So classic novels, um, you know, only 93% of Americans oppose banning classic novels. Um, 91% of Americans, <clears throat> um, oppose banning children's books that have banned for silly reasons like the Lorax, um, or Walter the Farting Dog. Um, most, most Americans, most American voters, um, uh, oppose banning on books that focus on race and slavery. So we even have, I mean, most of that. And then the least amount of support, uh, the, the least amount of opposition 
uh, the least amount of opposition to book banning comes from people who are concerned about sexuality, right? So 34% of Americans support banning books on sexuality. Um, what this kind of tells us, some, we can start thinking about some of the messages. Now, if, if we see the right using books like Gender Queer, Lawn Boy, and um, uh, uh, All Boys Aren't Blue or whatever, then what we need to be doing is, is putting out some examples of our own of books that are being banned for ludicrous reason and, and, and highlighting these. Um, uh, so that using like the Lorax, Walter the Farting Dog to talk more about um, The Handmaid's Dale or Of My and Kick to Kill a Mockingbird, et cetera. Um, and focusing on those and highlighting those as the examples that exemplify book banning across the country, um, we are gonna engage with more Americans who are on our side than any other thing. So. Uh, more as we learn about what they believe, um, you know, what is most concerning to them. The thing that's most in concerning people is that there is legislation that bans books. Um, uh, so they were, they were supposed to select their top three, the people that we asked this question to, um, that, that politicians are, are trying to block attempts to make reading material more diverse and representative of the full picture of America. Um, and that librarians are being charged for stocking certain books. Um, those are the messages that are most effective or that, that, that is most concerning to voters. So we know we can build messaging around um, uh, and spend more resources on messaging around um, some of the legislative um, prosecutory um, uh, attempts uh, at, at, at attacking librarians. Like there have been a couple of cases already and we need to be as an industry highlighting them more and pushing them more. Um, here's some information um, so that, that gets to some de demographics around um, partisanship. So who on the Dem side, who on the Republican side, which messages uh, re re uh, uh, resonate most with people who are Democrats, Republicans, and um, independents. Um, and you can see here, you know, there's um, uh, it's across the board that legislation to ban books on racism, inequality, and sexuality. The legislation is is really uh, highly opposed, um, and then blocking attempts to make reading more is across the board also one of the highest things. Um, as we deepen into more of this, um, you know, this is this is backing up from some of our earlier uh, data points. Um, treasure classics and ban the next. Children shouldn't have their education dictated by the whims of politicians or extreme act activists. So this is us testing messages um, in this poll. Um, that's the one that worked the most. Um, you know, uh, uh, if we push on banning those classics and we talk a lot more about the classics that are being banned, uh, we are going to gain a lot more traction with American voters, right? Um, uh, the other one that tests really, really high is if you don't like a book at a library, don't check it out. Um, this idea that that parents who are banning books are eliminating the freedoms of other parents. You're allowed to, you have parental rights over what your children check out. You don't have parental rights over what my children check out. And, and really pushing on that narrative is going to do a lot, again, to engage with the most amount of Americans. Um, you know, this is just more data on, on just that point. Don't check it out. Rates one of the highest. Classics, again, one of the highest. Um, uh, being free, access to a variety of books, and whether or not people are scared of people who are different than them, those are some of the highest testing um, things that we've seen. Now, if you have some of this data, you want to build some supporter models. So, of course, you know who to talk to. Um, you know, if we look at uh, who we would target based on this, you know, we would probably target um, women who are 35 to 49, who are uh, uh, black and white and Asian American or Pacific Islander, um, who are college, even though that's, I mean, that's within the margin of error, but um, primarily Democrats in the Northeast region, right? Like we could build, we could build, um, an, an ad audience with this. Now, of course, like we would, we would also look at like parents, homeowners, children, like there's a, there's a number of demographic features that we can look at to build these audience, but this is helping us narrow that down a bit. So then what we would do is we would plan our messaging. 
Um, you know, this, these are some of the key recommendations from Embold Research, um, ones we kind of talked about here. But, um, you know, book banning is, of course, we know about race and homophobia and transphobia, but opposition to book banning softens among Republicans. So if we're talking to Republicans, um, you know, we want to highlight books that aren't explicitly sexual or highlight gender ident identity um, or about race. Um, we want to talk about like classics, children's books being, because that resonates with them more. Um, you know, uh, as I was saying, we need to strive to make specific books more emblematic of the issue as a whole. So the Lorax, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird, whatever. Um, uh, common sense messaging is more effective, uh, is the most effective thing. So um, uh, if you don't like a book at the library, don't check it out. You know, we talked about that. Um, uh, the most effective way to capture a new audience is to highlight that the issue is overall just stupid. Like this is just a stupid, uh, an exercise in stupidity that's happening in America. And the more that we can make it look stupid, the more effective our messages are going to be. Um, you know, like us running out and, and defending gender queer immediately or, or defending all boys aren't blue isn't the way for us to win. The way for us to win is to create content um, uh, that is um, showing that and, and highlighting the stupidity of book banning. So these are some of the ones that we've that we've built um, primarily to promote our, our banned bookstore. Um, uh, I can get people to buy books, which raises us money, also identifies who's on our side or whatever. Um, but we can also have, we also have, instead of available at bandbookstore.com, we also have like sign the petition, take the pledge, you know, all kinds of different calls to action at that bottom. Um, but, you know, like um, how to eat fried worms was banned from various schools due to gambling and unacceptable social behavior, which if you ever read the book is super silly. Um, the Golden Compass was banned by Catholic schools for promoting atheism. Um, uh, banned first portrayal of violating freedom of religion in North Carolina. Like all these things are, I mean, these are very stupid things to be banning books about and, and highlighting these stupid reasons. Instagram putting them out um, across the widest spectrum uh, of people that targets um, the individuals that we think are going to um, uh, interact with it. So like, we might not put some of these on, you know, true social or whatever. So if you're looking at a social media platform like Instagram, who are the primary users? What's the age demographics? Are they the age demographics of the individuals who care about the, the in the same way we do? Who uses Facebook? How can we do targeting through uh, Facebook ads? to ensure that we put, you know, the right one of these in front of the right person at the right time, right? Um, uh, this is how we start building that pathway towards winning is by us spending significant resources on putting these messages in front of um, Americans who we know care based on the demographics of, uh, and the data that we found of the people who care, right? Uh, you can look at, if you have local news, news um if you want to write a letter to the editor before you write that letter to the editor look at who um who reads it if it's a conservative book if it's a conservative paper highlight um you know book banning that's happening you know on the conservative side or on, uh, on that are happening to conservatives highlighting book banning that's happening to democrats and democratic publications etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. um uh this is how we build and deploy more sophisticated messaging for libraries. Um, so we have uh, a couple of minutes for questions, if people have questions for me. So if you do, if you think of some questions later on, um you can find me online as pc sweeney um if you want more information about some of the bigger training that we're going to have that explores um a lot of the data around book banning in a lot more in uh, a lot more in depth and also about some of the messaging that we can create around book banning um then uh you know let me know and i can give you access to those trainings 
Thank you so much, team. I appreciate you being here. Please follow up if you have any questions. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, Michelle.